Hey YouTube, it's JB Dillon. We're going to get back into this Lloyd's 7H13G. We did another video on this quite a ways back. That was an analysis video. I'll include a link to that in the description. Uh, but long story short, the combination volume control power switch was defective. The volume control would not attenuate. It had poor sensitivity, likely due to a lot of dying capacitors. It's not a stereo unit. It's just a multi-speaker you know, fancy thing. So, grubbing around in my parts bins, I found a control that seems to be electrically equivalent. Uh, so we're going to see if we can make that work, and then replace all the caps, and see if we can maybe do a minor tweak alignment, get it to so that it works acceptably. So uh, let's get the back off. So it looks like getting this apart really isn't going to be all that tricky. Uh, there are there's basically one set of leads from the radio that come here that are paralleled over to this speaker and then a capacitor, the tweeter, that's paralleled over to this tweeter. So basically it's all just one giant 4 ohm load for this monument of high fidelity amplifier. Uh, but typically speaking, all these little gray caps, these black ones, they're all probably toast. Uh, this was... The dealy bobber this volume control is not very good it doesn't fully attenuate but uh, i wonder if what i have is really going to work because although this is uh the right electrical resistance well actually this one's a 10k that one's a 5k so we may have to shunt this one uh, and it, but it does have a switch uh, the switches may be rated for half an amp, which should be fine for this. I can't see this radio drying even that. Um, but we're going to have to see how well it works. And if not, I may have to just use a standard logarithmic 5K volume control and then just put a switch somewhere on it to make it work. So let's, uh, let's get it apart and take a look at the chassis and see what we're up against as far as making this operational. So we'll just start by taking the screws loose for the chassis. There's not a whole lot to this. There might be one behind here, but we'll find out. I'm hoping that this all just comes out as one piece and that I don't have to do these crazy amounts of disassembly to get it to uh, work. A lot of these screws are loose and the plastic around them is cracked. And then we've got the power board which may require that we take screws out from the bottom. You can see here that's holding the power board in. I'm just going to take it all out as one piece, if possible. Still got to pull the knobs off the front. Alright, so that's loose. Trying to see what else might be holding this in. Well, we do have, I can stop hitting that. We do have this plastic bracket up here. Gotta stop hitting the camera mount goes crashing to the ground. Oh, I see it. Okay, it seems like we're loose. So let's go ahead and take the knobs off.
Those are long shafts. Okay. Okay, so chassis is loose, so we do need to unsolder these leads here. Okay. All right, so that gives us a little freedom for the cabinet. And there's a busted piece that goes up there to hold that screw in. I think to give it time to set up, we'll uh, trickle some super glue into there. And yes, I know that that's not going to be a, a permanent repair. That's just to hold the damn thing in place. I'm going to trickle some super glue into here. And fit the busted piece of plastic back on there. And as it sets, we'll work on an epoxy solution that, in theory, will keep it together a little better. That's assuming that this will cooperate. And I apologize if I keep banging the camera. This like the mount's right in my face. And so I'm trying to do this with my arms at a distance. That's obviously not going to want to cooperate. There's some sort of distortion in the plastic. So I'm going to take my soldering iron and I'm going to make two little singe marks to fuse the little tiny bits of plastic together right here. To hold it in place. Ooh, that's hot. That way it'll stay in place while the glue sets. And then we'll rough it up and uh, make some epoxy stand off around it to reinforce it later. But for now, the cabinet can go away. And we can focus on the chassis which is, albeit primitive. I don't remember this ever lighting up, so that's maybe a lamp that we'll replace. Um, when I put that control, here we go. So it looks like this may be a little on the short side. I can extend the, I can extend it if need be. Don't really want to. Move this in a little bit here. You can see it a little better. But if you just look at it side by side, you see that this one's a, maybe a quarter of an inch shorter. Uh, we may be able to get away with that. So I'm going to go ahead and make a quick note here. Just on the bottom that that's going to be a black, yellow, and blue for our lead orientation. And then obviously our two power switch leads go where they go. And they appear to be on the secondary of the transformer, not the primary. I could be wrong on that one. Because it looks like this lead here. Well, no, it is on the primary. Okay. I don't like designs where the primary is always in circuit, so I will usually change them. Um, because if the primary fails, even if the radio is not on, it's going to create havoc. So let's unsolder this here. There's our... Oh, that's nice. That just broke right off. Our AC power there. That's another reason why I am so hesitant to 
unsolder and remove wires from old terminals is because of what you just saw there. I'd rather J hook it if I knew I was keeping this part. So I'm just going to clip these, save some time. I'm going to restrip them anyways. And they got some glue on here. And everybody ask, asks me about these uh, box head wrenches. And I don't know what they're called. They are made by a company called Hosen. 11 and 12 millimeter. They're great for these things. I haven't been able to find them new. I kind of inherited them. So I've been using them and they've been great. But I don't know where you get replacements. I've never seen another set. I've got a set of three different sizes for all the common potentiometer nuts and jack nuts. They work really good. You can get a, what is it called? Like a guitar, like a jack tool or something like that. I forget what they call it. Anyways, old one comes out. The switch on that still, well, I could use that terminal. See, that's only rated for an amp. But the, uh, the carbon wiper on this was most certainly dead. It did not fully attenuate. In fact, it was pretty loud, as I recall. I'm probably going to have to bust off the, the key tab there because it's not going to fit with our current configuration. This was meant for like a little transistor radio, and it does not work. So what I'm going to do is get some pliers and very carefully snap off this tab usually comes off pretty easy there it is and then we'll just affix this um, one thing this parts in good shape one thing that happens is this here I don't know if you can see this I don't know if it's gonna focus on it that little phenolic thing that bumps the switch on and off uh, that cracks sometimes so if you start to see a little crack here reinforce it with epoxy just a tiny little bit so it doesn't gunk up the switch I have no idea how long this parts gonna last it was kind of a new old stock part we'll see and let me just orient this and then we'll it's already got a washer on there because I don't need that. And so the nut that came with it is much smaller. So I'm going to use my smaller of the two if I can find it, if it hasn't been absconded with. There we go. So this is a six millimeter, it says? No. A nine millimeter. And a 10, 10 is the one that fits. So I'm just going to snug this down. I can't tighten that too much more without making it spin. But that should work. All right, let's trim this. Put some solder on the ends here. One thing I'm starting to find more and more is that keg deoxid is not the best choice for old pots like this. Because in the first video, I believe that we cleaned it, and that's when we discovered we washed the carbon away and that there was no more attenuation. So... For old pots like this, I use the CRCQD stuff, which uh, doesn't seem to obliterate whatever adhesive measure, uh, measures are holding the carbon track on. Keg, are you listening? Maybe you should look into that, especially considering how many people use keg products for cleaning pots like myself. All right. So 
let's go ahead and strip strip these wires here I'm just waiting for the phone calls to start pouring and it's about an hour and a half before we open this is usually when people start calling incessantly I think as a precaution I'm going to turn the ringer off otherwise we won't hear the end of it okay that's one Look at this tremendous amount of service slack here. Probably because they assume you're going to have to take that board up and troubleshoot it. Or maybe not. Maybe they were just lazy and put extra wire on it. I don't know. It's just nice to have that. And we got the third one. Now the original was a 5K. And depending on how well it loads down the amplifier circuit, 10 may be acceptable, or we may have to shunt this with a 5, uh, 10K to make it 5, so that the volume control behaves more linearly. I really don't know until we get there. Okay, so that's in there. So now we got our power switch volume control thingy. And hopefully that will help us get there. Um, let's see how easy it is to get to the back side of the board. If we remove this, the dial face here, which looks like four screws, we can get to the back of the board easy without having to take it up for the caps, which is kind of what I want to do. Um, well, let's do a quick check here, and let's see if I'm going to have to make an extension for the volume control or if it will just fit in here. This is going to be that shining moment. Let me see if this works. Oh yeah. That'll work out okay, it looks like. I got plenty of space there to tool around with that. That way I don't have to worry about making an extension for that potentiometer, which is although possible a pain, especially for something that just needs so little additional. All right. And just to see that our Switch install was good. Let's see, you guys can't really see that. Let's turn our switch on and see if we see prim primary on the transformer. And we do. Turn it off. No more primary. Okay, so the switch is in circuit. That's happy. And just for grins and giggles, let's see if we have... This should be fully attenuated. Yep, it is. 
And on the other end, we should get about 10K. 9.5, something I think I saw. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay. So off to our super fun recap. There's thankfully not very many of them here. Uh, I think we're... We should be okay. Let's see, I count uh, four, eight, ten total. And knowing that the age that this is, most of these small ones are very likely 5 or 10 microfarad. That seems to be the engineer's choice. Or maybe 11 caps there. Let's see here. Just trying to get a good vantage for... Like that's a 5. That's a 10. That's another 5 there. This guy's a 5. That's probably a 5. Who knows what these are. These are probably like 22s down here, these guys here. Hard to see with the junk in the way. Oh, that's a 30, so we'll use a 33. And then these guys are all, this is a 200 microfarad, probably your output capacitor, or maybe the 100 microfarads here, the output capacitor, I don't know. Anyways, uh, these are just all going to go away. Because... They're old. So I'm going to go ahead and start by taking this dial shield away. Again, bear with me here because the camera is literally inches from me and so that's why I'm using an extension screwdriver so that I can set this far back enough where all y'all can see it. And let's move this up a pinch. Back a little bit. All right. This is a little bit better from the standpoint of serviceability. Maybe I'll just leave it here and use zoom. And then we'll pull this I'll take the light socket out without breaking the tuning string. Push back on this. Let's very carefully determine how to get this out without breaking the tuner string. There we go. Don't want to have to restring it. Okay, so as you can see, here's another guy hiding here. So that's, what, 12 capacitors now? We've got complete access to the back side of the circuit board. That's a 12-volt lamp. Filament's still intact, looks like. That's probably 100 milliamps, maybe. So that's a lot of load to put on that little tiny transformer back there, just for a light. But whatever. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to start grabbing values of caps. And then we can just start cranking this out. Let me make some marks as to where they are. This looks like it still runs on uh, negative bias because the positive of a lot of the capacitors are at ground potential. So we got that there. At least I think so. Yeah, we got that there. We got this one. Does that go up or down? That goes down. So that's a cap. And then this one here. I'll go back and forth. It's over here. So that's likely a cap. And we got that there, which is obvious. We got this little bugger. 
Yeah, that goes off to the right there. So you're a cap. You're a cap, there a cap, everywhere a cap, cap. There's another one that looks like it's right here. This one over here. And then we have the ones at the bottom here. That looks like it. And then we have a couple more. That looks like one. And then finally, the one over here at the edge of the board. That's one there. Exciting. All right. Let's go get our values and jump into this thing. Okie dokie. So I think I got everything I need. We're just going to start unsoldering these things. And I haven't made a map, so I'm going to replace them one by one. And try to maintain correct polarity and such. That's the first one, that's a 200. So we're going to do a 220 because it's the closest thing I have. Please feel free to use the high speed times two setting for this part because I'm sure this is going to take a while. All right, that's one. Here's one of these little guys here. One thing I don't like about a lot of these early Japanese boards is that they have no symmetry and structure. They just kind of shove it wherever they can find space. I don't know if that's because they were hand drawn or because uh, somebody's poor engineering styles or habits. It really doesn't matter. Just find it interesting, that's all. And let's pull this guy out. And you are 10 microfarad. And it looks like that's the positive facing inward. I know what you're thinking to yourself. Why is he bothering to fix this crappy little radio? Because I can. And because I'd rather see something like this operative again than just hit the trash bin. I mean, granted, you can't save them all. But the ones that I can save, I certainly like to. I definitely don't have the patience or perhaps the skill set that Shango does with a lot of these resurrections. He is probably one of the best troubleshooters on the internet, as far as I'm concerned, in electronics. He's probably been doing this longer than I, too. Let's see. That's producing no change. Trying to figure out which one of these leads. There we go. Let me whip that away. Yeah, I enjoy watching his vids because he brings some dead stuff back to life. Really dead. I'm sure you're a subscriber. If you're not, you should be one. Uh, another guy to check out is Heath. H-E-A-T-H-77. Another really sharp young kid that's going to go places. Good troubleshooter, repairs lots of gear. He needs subscribers right now, so go check out his channel. Heath77. Let's see now.
you go in there. Next, I'm going to do this guy here. This is the mundane world of recapping. I really don't like recapping. I know it's a necessity on most of this old gear. But... It's boring. You're just replacing parts. That's all you're doing. And depending on how sharp you are in the day, let's say you've had your coffee, you're good to go. You know, it's not a big deal. But what if you're not sharp? What if you're dragging or making mistakes or something like that. You can see where that a little bit of electrolyte pissed onto the board there. Uh, you make mistakes. Mistakes that can be... Yeah, mistakes. Mistakes that can be uh, detrimental to the repair work. For example, yesterday, I worked on a Pioneer SX780, very popular receiver, and it had gone to one of these outfits like, you know, irecappioneers.com kind of thing. Not that that is a real place, but it's an example. And uh, the machine looked nice, and the soldering work was good. And he had put veneer on the cabinet instead of the contact paper stuff, which looked very pleasing to the eye. It was a very nice-looking machine. But when it came back to him, the tuner was dead. I mean dead, dead. Like, no FM, silence, everything. Well, what it turned out to be was the PA 3001 AIC was cooked. Uh, it was just putting DC out on all the pins rather than appropriate voltages per the schematic. So I said, okay, Yankee, Yankee, you come out. And I took it out, and I had a replacement. And I put the replacement in, and I had the set on a current limiter, or that the tuner on a current limiter, rather. I stuck a, a little... 50 milliampere lamp in series with the FM supply line and it got super bright and I said hmm that ain't right and it was trying to murder the new IC and I kept wondering why is that why what's going on here well it turned out that in the process of this massive recap this guy did that uh, he botched a few things Primarily, he stuck in a bunch of caps that were backwards at the output and input of the 3001 IC. And what that was doing was it was upsetting the voltages on those pins to the point where it was causing the IC stress. Not sure exactly. Can't really explain it. Just know that that IC was getting hot and it was drawing a lot of current. And that went away once I corrected the uh, polarity. And it's not like there was a mistake on the silk screening board. You know, all... All the silk screening was correct. They were just installed incorrectly. And that's the problem with recapping is it's so mundane and boring that you most people aren't paying attention and they make a mistake that can hurt the machine. And so I spent a, a little bit of time troubleshooting that because I thought that, you know, it was done by a reputable service and turns out that the guy made enough mistakes that it hurt things. So, yeah, anyway, food for thought. That's why I don't like recapping. It's just mundane work. We'll do this guy right here, the little tin microfarad. And you know, I used to be against the whole recap everything completely. And to an extent I am, depending on the age of the machine and the use. You'll still get these fanatical people that don't like you have to replace every capacitor in the machine before it'll work. And 
as the machines age, that is becoming more and more true. Like these 60s tube radios uh, that use like Japanese oil caps. These ones like this, which use all these electrolytic things. Um, they just die. They get old, they die, and then the set doesn't work right. So, yeah, it, they're getting older. It's not just, you know, one or two caps that are bad now. It's handfuls of them. And it's gotten to the point where if you don't change them all in some scenarios, the set comes back every time with another complaint. So, I have gotten into the habit of if the set is built before a certain date or it meets certain criteria, I just recap them. So, like, the criteria is, is uh, from these, the sampling machines of machines that I seem to get, the commonality is before 1975. The majority of machines that I see made before 1975 are getting to the point where they all need recaps. Even the main power supply electrolytics are starting to leak. Uh, the regulator caps are all but dead. Um, stuff in the signal path has drifted so far out of tolerance that it's throwing off the tonal response of the preamps. But when you look after 75, when you get into like 76, 77, etc., then you get back to only certain populations of parts. And uh, that seems to be a broad spectrum across manufacturing, with the exception of Technic stuff. I find that uh, most of the Technic stuff, all those purple and blue Matsushita capacitors, they're all leaking or shorted or dead. And so uh, you do have to shotgun recap pretty much any Technics receiver made. They didn't start changing their uh, capacitor manufacturing until the late 80s, I think. Because you see Technic stuff from the 90s, that's fine. But when you get below about 1987, every single capacitor in this set is just leaky. It's pissing electrolyte or something. It's just terrible. But yeah, otherwise... Post-75 only requires secular attention, whereas um, pre-75 is getting gross recap more and more. Okay, so it looks like we're just down to this group here. And then we can uh, start playing around with putting it back together. So let's see, you're a 5. You're probably a 5. And then we have the two 33s there. Let's pull two fives out just in case. And let's see here. That's going to be this guy here, actually. I mismarked it. Then we can see if it works. Or works better, anyways. I don't know how well it's going to work. I think the biggest challenge in this field is not the equipment itself, but dealing with the people who own it. And the internet has made repairing these things a bit of a chore because people come pretty armed with information that is largely anecdotal and may not apply to their set. It may not, I mean, it, it may be that that problem that they describe affects their set. But what I find when I actually put it on the diagnostic bench is, is that the problem that they came in for and the problem that they describe are two entirely different things. And you have to try to convince them of your findings, which is why I will usually do a brief examination at the counter while you wait if possible so that we can both come to a consensus through visualization of the problem in front of them as to what the findings really are. And that, that kind of sort of works to an extent. But other times, uh, people are just really, 
really impatient. And they just, or they just want to drop it off and not have to deal with you. That happens too. People are just impatient. They think that you can just leave it with a handshake and a phone number and you can't. You can't do that. That's not how you run a business like this. You have to generate paperwork. You have to formalize the transaction in some way or another so that if push comes to shove, the business can protect itself against you know people who are dishonest or accusations from the owners about things that may or may not be true. Uh, but it's, it's all stuff that, that comes up on a daily basis here. And I would say about 60% of doing this is putting out fires. Because people will want to argue certain things, regardless of your experience and knowledge, they'll want to buck you on it. They'll want to say, this is what I read. What I read must trump what you say, even though you have now hard scientific evidence of what the actual failure is right in front of them. So, lots of frustrations. And as the years go on, it makes me want to do this for the public a lot less. And there are still customers left in the world that are grateful for my service, for what I do. I mean, I do get a lot of praise and a lot of thanks through the YouTube channel, through social media, um, here locally. Because there is a lot of people that have known me long enough that uh, I'm doing this because I enjoy doing it. I don't make a ton of money off this. And the cost of doing business in California is crazy. Uh, Fred, the guy who owns this business, whom I work for, has been in the game a long time and he's seen lots of opportunities and working with him for more than 15 years has taught me a lot about this business and uh, it seems to be getting kind of scarier as the times go on so I really don't know how long I'll be doing this in the public eye I may just go back to doing it out of my workshop at home see I think that's what I'm after right there let's see now I'm sure that's a person who's shown up a half hour before their appointment demanding my attention let's see if I can get this out of here without too much trouble This area here is really confined, so it's kind of tricky to get the capacitor out. Let's see. Getting close to opening time, too. I have to open the store up in about a half an hour or so. My time on this is limited. Okay, so we started there. I guess this goes over here. This part is fighting me. Okay. You're the 30 microfarad. And this part goes to the outside.
All right. So we got this guy left, which looks like he goes from between. Okay, he's at an angle. So this guy here and here, which means I got to heat that up again. Fun, fun. All right. Okay. That's going to be uh, the 30 with the positive down. Yeah, I think they run this on a negative voltage because all the significant decoupling caps are all at ground. With the positive lead at ground. That's kind of weird. I don't really see that all that much. Okay. Wonderful. That lead that I marked is nothing to do with it. Just something different. Okay. We got one left, which is this guy up here. And that's another 30 microfarad. So we'll just use another 33 microfarad. So I'm going to make little notes here. That's a lead there, and that's a lead there. And it looks like the positive is facing downward. Let's bend that a little tiny bit. Fresh solder, too. No okay, dokie. Okay. We're good there. So there's our happy little recap. Let's uh, get the dial cover back on it. Okay. socket back in assuming it's not going to fight me okay. all right also got to make sure I'm not running into any important tuner string things let's just do a quick check here and make sure that i can still rotate the tuner yes i can all right
come on. Thread. Put our silly little lamp back in here. All right. So I guess now what we have to do, now that I've got all these fancy new caps in here, is to see if the silly thing actually works. And then uh, do any necessary tweaks. So I'm going to go ahead and pop it in the cabinet. I put some epoxy on that standoff that was busted, so we're just going to crank it down, hope for the best, and uh, turn it on and see what happens. Okay, so here she is all back in the cabinet. I did forget the little screw thing here, which fell off my bench. I'm about ready to just grab another one. But before we go too crazy, let's put all the knobs on here. And then we'll see if it uh, behaves itself, if it runs. And I know this is all something that we're waiting for to figure out if all that work was warranted. Nice to know that that switch went on right. Trying to key all the knobs so that they go in the right spots. So straight up and down mark there. All right. So let me get the cheater cord. We'll plug this thing in and see if it bursts into flames or if it runs. I'm hoping for the latter, not the former. find out what's going on there because I certainly don't remember that happening before. Almost like we got a uh, bad filter or bad ground. Let's uh, check the filter real quick. Let's see what El Cap Wizard says about the filter here. Yeah, filter's good. So there's something else going wrong. Again, about the whole recap thing and then you make a mistake. <laughs> so we got to examine our work really carefully and see what I may have missed. I may have created a short or a bridge or something like that. So out it comes again, and then we'll take a look at our work and see what we may have botched. So there's one right there, a loose ground right there. That's not good. And then there's one over here, which looks like it's there, but may not be. Yeah, let me just take a quick look around here, make sure there's no shorts or anything like that. That solder could use a little touch up. Let's see. Turn this over and make sure I didn't pop any of the eyelets out. Yeah, that looks good there. Didn't break any connections free. Trying to see if there's any short circuits I may have made. So far, it doesn't look like it. We've got one poor connection there. And it could be that's in the wrong place, too. I'll have to review the video, but we'll take care of the obvious two grounds. 
I'll check this and see if that needs to be receded in the same spot. Because I remember this popped up briefly while I changed this capacitor. But I did not know where it went. Oh, look at that. That didn't quite catch either. So let's resolder these points and try again. Okay, so we've made those corrections. Let's just try it again briefly. So that's working. At some level, and I think he all that his is out. So that's working quite well now. So I think what we'll do is now we'll put it back in the cabinet and do the alignment and tweaks and stuff. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing dialed in a little bit better. I'm just going to use a little pathetic clip lead for an antenna. And crank up the signal generator and plug it in. And excuse the background noise because we just got sued from Crazy Tear. see if we can't dial this in a little bit better. A little bit off. Right now it's reading about 96 on the top. Okay. Let's see if we can get this oscillator dialed in. Okay. There we go. Let's reduce the signal. And then we'll dial in our trimmers. there from the excess signal. Let's reduce that a little bit. And let's see if we can make the uh, IF a little bit happier. These are all pretty well peaked out already. That's pretty good as is. Cautious. Can she know? I can lost position for the Much better on the sensitivity. Knowledgeable agents who take the time. Let me see if I can dial that in a little bit better without getting a copyright strike. All right, so I have the scope hooked up, 
and we're feeding a over-the-air signal from our SoundTech 1000. No modulation, just the 10.7. And so on the bottom trace here, we're looking at the IF information. And as I turn the signal strength on the generator up and down, you can see the amplitude of that increases and de decreases. The top trace uh, is going to be audio. So when we add the modulation, we'll be able to uh, check things like distortion and such. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go to the output of the tuner and we're going to adjust this for peak amplitude. Let's see if I can switch to my other tool because apparently this is conductive enough that it's become a problem. Bear with me here, I'm trying to hold a bunch of stuff at once. Oh, come on, really? All right, let me switch to another tool because that one doesn't have a good head on it anymore. So yeah, we're just going to peek that as best we can there. Adjustment's really touchy. All right, so let's go to our first IF. Let's see, let's peek that out. Second IF. That's pretty well peaked. And then we have our detector. And for that, we're going to need audio. So let me add the modulation here. And let me switch over to modulation only. Add some more signal. Okay. So let's adjust our detector for uh, minimum distortion here. The way that I do it without an, uh, a marker generator is uh, I will peek out the IF first so that I know that the tuner's spot on and then I'll adjust the detector for minimum distortion. So that's the secondary maximum amplitude there. And then the primary we'll look at maximum amplitude and minimum distortion. So that's about your peak point right there. Let me turn this down a little bit so that we don't have to listen to it through the speaker. And let me crank up the modulation until we get clipping. You see there we get a little bit of clipping. And so I'm going to adjust the primary on the detector for symmetrical clipping. Which is about at that point. So we're at 150% modulation, which is really high. But this helps you set the detector without needing a marker and all that which is especially helpful if you got them double humps. And you can see one direction we get distortion, another direction we get distortion. So just make it so that the waveform looks as clean as possible. And we'll back it off to about 50% modulation. And now we got a clean looking sine wave, which we can hear through the speaker. And we've also got decent sensitivity. I can go down to about 30 microvolts before it's useless, which for a radio of this type is pretty good. So I think we're all set. Uh, let's take one last listen to it real quick. All right, let's see if I can avoid a copyright strike. <laughs> Delta del 
el coronavirus. Now, this may not be great, but I'll tell you that we're in a cinder block building with rebar, so radio doesn't get in here very well. And we could only get about three stations before, now we're getting a whole bunch. Pretty good selectivity, too. No bleed through. Doing pretty good. So there's Radio Guadalupe. The television portion of it went off air, but they're still broadcasting on IFM here. ...in isolation for five days and found hanging from a bed sheet in his cell. AM's a little off, though. ...opportunity to kill himself. Several other... Like, that's 600 right there. So we need to adjust the AM oscillator. Let me just do that real quick. All right, so that's better. The AM on this is just terrible. Like, that's supposed to be 640. Can't get nothing there. Importante como five eight as a freshman three persona as a freshman. You can kind of hear ten seventy back there, but it's being walked all over. So selectivity is junk. So that's a little better. I tweaked the IF some on the AM, and that cleaned it up. Still can't do KFI. But uh, FM sounds pretty good. So I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. At some point, maybe I'll add a auxiliary in or something like that, because it doesn't sound like a bad radio, but the uh, AM performance is definitely subpar. The FM's okay. So it came out. So, uh, yeah. Boil his complaint. Someone boil his complaint down. Stop telling me I have to wear a mask. Okay. Does he have to wear a mask? So this thing's working pretty good now. It definitely benefits by a, a line antenna instead of just the regular power cord. I can see behind me the window worked fine because they handed the food to the person. If not, get ready for the nation to find vaccines near you. No wild in your way. Was open naked. Brought to you by Roto. The only really two strong stations in this area are. Uh, 91X and uh, 101.5 KGB. Where people were told to wear a gold. Who's the yellow carry? The ultimate once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, a lot of great radio in San Diego. Yeah, for details. The UN. Something amazing. Discover matches. I'm seeing how many people the AM could be better but uh, yeah so anyway uh, all fixed up happy and smiling hope you guys enjoyed this video uh, this will likely be up for adoption so keep an eye on the eBay page uh, my eBay handle is JP Dillon of course and uh, more stuff to come in the future but uh, right now this is it Thanks for watching.